what happened was she kept questioning me at her level of right. analysis, and that just wasn't working because that wasn't the level of analysis at which I'm playing. And, I, and well, and I'm also not playing, although I'm trying to play. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Because right. it's better well, it's if you can yeah, play exactly. a little bit. But yeah, I it's, mean, it's I, like wrestling. You had a lower base of gravity, mm -hmm. and and I think that that gave you an advantage. And that's, well, and, partly I wasn't trying to win the interview. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like I and I don't try to win interviews. I try to go to an interview and have a talk and have a discussion and see well, how it goes. And I don't have an agenda except to not make a catastrophic mistake. But that's, that's agenda number yeah, one. Well, yeah. Don't say anything unforgivably stupid. Yeah. I would say about 700 of you roughly uh, requested for him to be on the show and for us to sit down. I've read a lot about him lately. And uh, Jordan, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Ruben Report. Thanks very much. So thank you for being our Google Hangout guinea pig and bearing with us as we are in between studios. This is a pure free speech zone. That probably makes the guy like you feel pretty good, huh? Yeah, well, you know, good. That means we might be able to discuss some things that are important instead of pussyfooting around. Absolutely. So let's get right to it. So for people that don't know your story, what has sort of put you in the news over the last couple of months, uh, it's actually quite astounding because you are in Canada, which is a place that has a strong tradition of free speech. So for people that have no idea what's going on with you, uh, can you just lay out the, the basics of what's transpired over the last couple months? Yeah, well, there's, a, there's some new legislation that's pending at the federal level called Bill C-16. And Bill C-16 adds gender identity and gender expression to the list of protected categories under the Canadian Human Rights Code. Canadian Human Rights Act and uh, also adds transgressions against those categories, people who are in those categories, uh, to the hate speech provisions of the criminal code. So it's it's very very punitive legislation, and that in itself is 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 somewhat appalling. Although it's not obvious why, but there's similar legislation already in many provinces in Canada, which equivalent to the state level, and. Uh, the, the, there's a requirement that, or, that originated in Ontario for people to use preferred, what, they're, what are called preferred pronouns to address someone. And as far as I can tell, by reading over the legislation, failure to use someone's preferred pronouns is now a hate crime in Canada. Right. And, so let's, let, let's just pause there for a second. Yeah, I want, right. I want people to really understand what that means. That hmm. means that if you potentially accidentally refer to someone, as the wrong pronoun, uh, you may not realize if someone happens to be a, a male or a female, uh, you could potentially be in legal trouble. Now that also you could do it intentionally, which I think under free speech would be fine as well, but even accidentally, we're going down a pretty slippery slope here. Yeah, well, in the legislation, like, there, there are legal moves afoot in many organizations uh, at a policy level or a legal level to also alter the way that the law is interpreted so that instead of judging someone on the intent of their speech, you judge them on the consequences of their speech. Mm -hmm. And also um, to, to, and this is particularly true, say with sexual harassment policies, to remove, and this is happening mostly at universities right now, although it'll, it'll happen in other organizations soon enough, to remove, if you're accused of sexual harassment or worse, instead of you presumed innocent until proven guilty, they use the doctrine of preponderance of evidence. And so, so not only are there changes afoot to, to regulate the way that people speak, they call that uh, compelled speech. The American Supreme Court ruled on that at one point and ruled it unconstitutional, that it contradicted the First Amendment, that compelled speech. So, but in Canada, I think these pieces of legislation are also unconstitutional, but of course no one's yet challenged them as far as you'd have to challenge them to prove that, which would be all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, okay, so we're obviously gonna focus mostly on the free speech component of it, yeah. but I, I would imagine that there's probably a few people listening to this that would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe this guy just doesn't like transgender people. Maybe he just wants to be offensive to transgender people. So. I'll just kick that back to you. Is that the case at all? Well, a lot of the people who've been pushing this legislation um, claim to be speaking for the transgendered community, but that's not self-evident to me at all. I've received many letters of support from transgendered people and actually just did a conversation with a transgendered woman in Vancouver. 
most transgendered people, especially the classic type, I would say, speaking psychologically, mm -hmm. are people who've had a difficult time adjusting to their biological sex identity since they were young. And some of them undergo fairly radical transformations in an attempt to become the other sex. And they have no problem with pronouns. They just want to be the other one. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. So they don't have any problem with he or she. In fact, they undergo a tremendous amount of trouble, I would say, to transform themselves for better or worse into a member of the opposite sex. Um, the people who are pushing this legislation forward claim to speak for the transgendered community, but you can claim to speak for any community you want. That doesn't make you a legitimate representative. Right. So, so that's a great point. And actually, the, the girl that you spoke to up in Vancouver, we've had on our Rubin Report fan show. So people can oh. check that out. Her name is Theron Meyer. I think she's an excellent spokesperson for the trans community. Uh, I don't know that she's asking to be a spokesman for the trans community, but sometimes people are sort of just thrust into things. Um, so, OK, so in and of itself, you have no problem with trans people, right? Is that fair to say? Well, I don't I don't. I don't have any problem with trans people. Um, I mean, I'm a clinical psychologist. I've dealt with every variety of person you could possibly imagine and a fair number of people that you couldn't possibly imagine. And, and I'm, uh, so I'm quite comfortable with people who don't fit normally into normal categories. And yeah. I know how to deal with people who are in that situation very well. So the idea that I'm doing this because I'm somehow made nervous by people who don't fit neatly into gender categories is it's exactly the sort of trick that you'd expect people on the radical left to pull because it's what they do all the time they call me a racist too because the university of toronto human resources and equity department has been taking advice from a group called the black liberation collective um, which was formulated by uh, two women one is who one who is a self-avowed black suprematist who believes that white people are inferior because they don't have enough melanin, melanin in their skin and that makes them unable to receive cosmic energy and transform it into proper thought and is that, is that what my problem is that is definitely your problem and the other one is under investigation for embezzling three hundred thousand dollars from the university of toronto students union and so and they also uh will not disavow violence in their pursuit of social transformation. The University of Toronto HR and Equity Department is taking policy advice from them, uh, which I think is appalling. Um, and because I've objected to that, I've been tarred with the epithet of racist. So, but yeah. it's typical. It's, it's typical of this kind of mob behavior that the, that the PC authoritarians like to engage in whenever anybody ruffles their feathers. <sighs> I've been wrestling with this idea because I'm going to give some biblical lectures starting in, on May 16th And so I've been starting to think about conceptualizations of God for example And one of the things that's very interesting about the Old Testament is that There's a there's a distinction made between countries that rule by the ruler mm -hmm. who's God and Countries that are ruled by God who's not the ruler Okay, so strip it for a minute of its religious language and imagine this instead Imagine that what we consider God is the abstraction of the ideal by which people have to orient themselves to produce a functional society. It's an abstraction, right? right? So it's just sort of the the basic underlying truth of how we are able to function as a group of people. Yes, properly. And you can't identify it with any one person because mm -hmm. when you identify it with the person, then the system then, gets corrupted because mm -hmm. the person gets inflated, let's say. This would be like the Pharaoh, basically. Yes, in, exactly in, like, yeah. precisely like that. that okay. That's exactly the, that, that's the canonical story in the Old Testament. Yeah. Is the Pharaoh is the earthly ruler who demands everything that you should provide to God. Mm -hmm. well, what's God? Well, we'll, we'll can speak about it from an evolutionary psychology perspective. God is the idea of the abstract ideal. And you separate it out from, from the actual ruler, just like in, 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 in our society. The idea of sovereignty is abstracted from the president, right? The president comes and goes. The sovereignty of the president remains. The sovereignty of the president is a very abstract idea because it's disembodied, right? It's disembodied. Now, how we were chimps for God's sake. How long do you think it took us to figure out how to disembody the idea of sovereignty from the individual? Man, it was like, well, it was, it was maybe up until, uh, maybe it took us till 150,000 years ago to start, to start formulating that. 
you know, in, in some articulated way, in some mm -hmm. abstract way. I think we could recognize it before then. And the way you recognize it is through admiration. Right? If you meet someone that you admire, there's someone you want to imitate. And what it is, imagine this pattern that will move you up the hierarchy. And then you see people who manifest different elements of it. And you see someone who manifests an element that you don't have, and something in you responds to that with, with admiration. It's unconscious, right? Because it pulls mm -hmm. you towards them. It's not voluntary. You see that really with kids a lot when they when they hero worship someone and start to imitate them. Right. You know, but but the same thing happens throughout culture. I mean, yeah. It, you you could probably make an interesting argument related to Trump with this because it was like some people I think subconsciously, although somewhat <laughs> consciously, saw him and they said, "Wow, he says whatever he wants." Yeah. And they love that. And then you could also argue the reverse. Some people saw him saying whatever he wants and they thought this is this is the end of civilization. Right. This is this is some monster for civilization. So that does sort of also go to I guess self deception and how we all are viewing things differently constantly all the time. Well, there's a bunch of ways that, that you can bias your information intake, let's say. Now what should happen is, roughly speaking, I guess, is that you have a field of information, let's say it's behavioral information, so it's information that would be relevant to how you conduct yourself, mm -hmm. which isn't the same as factual information, which is another mistake that I think Harris makes. Um, what you want is an unbiased sample of that. You yeah. can't understand all of it because it's too complex. Wait, wait, let's just back up for a second yeah. just to be clear. So the, I think everyone would understand what factual information yeah. is. What's the other part then? Give me an example of the other part. The other part is what makes you admire someone. So it's just the, it's the innate feeling, sort of. Well, it's, it's, it's what you get when you go to a movie, say that's, that's an animated movie. We talked about that a little yeah. bit with Pinocchio, for yeah. example, is that what's being presented there are descriptions of patterns of behavior. They're not you, they're fact-like, but the, the reason that they're different than facts is because you can immediately act them out. Mm -hmm. You can't act out a fact. It's right. like, so imagine that you're standing in front of a field. If you adopted Harris's point of view, as far as I can tell, the field would tell you how to walk through it. But it doesn't. It, it offers you an infinite number of ways to walk through it. And then how you walk through it depends on your value system. It depends on what you want. That's the thing, that's where values enter in. You're gonna walk through the field towards your goal, and your goal is something you value. And that's built right into our perception. You can't even look at the world without a goal, because there's too much of the world, and if you don't have a goal, then you don't know what to look at. It'll just be chaotic, hmm. or meaningless, either one of those two, overwhelming or meaningless. And so the, 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 the value system is built into the perceptions. Now, that, brings us back to the bias issue is that when you when you look at a field of behavioral information let's say or even factual information for that matter your temperament is going to screen a lot of it out for you and that's good because otherwise you'd be overwhelmed but let's say you're a person who's not creative and, and that generally tends to make people more conservative anything that has to do with aesthetics generally speaking isn't going Just, to glimmer for you right yeah. it's not going to attract your interest now, if you're an extrovert, then social things are attract your interest. And if you're an agreeable person, then things about relationships will attract your interest. If you're disagreeable, it's more likely to be about machines and things. So, but that's all happening before you think. Now, mm -hmm. there's feedback loops, of course, but it happens before you think. You're carving out a niche in the world, and there's lots of different ways you can be in the world. So that's one form of bias. Yeah. And you see this in, in, the, in the realm of politics, because we know, for example, that you can predict people's political beliefs if you know their temperament, and quite well. So, if people are high in trait openness, which is creativity, creativity and interest in abstract ideas, roughly speaking, and low in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, you're going to be a liberal. You're going to lean to the left. Hmm. You're going to be a liberal, but the politically correct types are different. Right, right, right. And if you're low in openness and high in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, you're going to be a conservative. And the relationship is actually quite tight. Um, if you just look at how people vote, the relationship isn't that powerful. But if you do a detailed analysis of their beliefs, say conservative versus liberal, the amount of political belief that temperament accounts for goes way up. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Yeah, well, you've got to improve, right? And so, 
and you might think, well, I'm a real fixer-upper and I'm really embarrassed about that because there's 50 things wrong with me and like, look at that guy and so now I feel all terrible because of the comparison and all of that. And First of all, it's unfair because, especially by the time you're about 30, like when you're 17, you're like every other 17-year-old and so that kind of social comparison is more appropriate. By the time you're about 30, your life has become quite idiosyncratic, you know. Like, let's say your life has eight dimensions, family, friends, intimate relationships, health, you know, you can kind of lay them out. You're individually positioned in all those dimensions. Your life isn't like anyone else's life. And so you see someone who's doing better than you. It's like you're only seeing one dimension at one slice of time. So it's not reasonable. You're not, you don't have the whole picture, you know. So, and then you, you, you get down on yourself and, and take the spirit out of yourself and you get bitter and resentful. It's like that, there's nothing good about that. Yeah. So, so, but you do need to improve because there's more to you than, there's not as much of you as there should be. So what's the comparison? Well, that's easy. You just say, okay, well, here, here's my position in time and space right now. Here's my virtues and faults. It's like, I can be a little bit better tomorrow in some minor way. Well, that's the right comparison because you are very much like you. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everything's the same about you. Yeah. And so it's the perfect comparison. And then you get a trajectory going. It's like, well, I, obviously I'm not perfect, but I'm slightly less terrible than I was yesterday. Man, you keep that up for five years and you're wherever you should be. That isn't where someone else should be, right? Because you really are an individual. There, there's so. an interesting element of this <clears throat> on, on a biblical note that I think you hit sometimes, which is sort of, don't pray to false gods because it's like, it's sort of like, well, the guy that you're looking at that you think has everything, yeah. you have no idea. Yeah, you, right. You, and we see that now with all these people crumbling in Hollywood that are worshiped by so many people who have done all sorts of terrible oh, yeah. things or, or whatever it is. Yeah, well, you just don't have insight into the tragedy of someone else's life. You know, and you might think, well, he's rich and successful. It's like, yeah, but you just don't know. You don't know what his relationship is with his wife or his children. You know, you don't know that he's gone through two divorces and his daughter won't talk to him and one of his kids is schizophrenic. And like most people's lives are pretty nicely <laughs> saturated with tragedy, you know, and with a certain degree of malevolence. And you might think, well, I'd trade places with him in a minute. And I'm also not saying that some people don't have it really rough. It's course, like, look, course. man, some people have it rough. Yeah. That's not the point. It's not the point. The point is, you should be better than you are, but it's not because you're worse than other people. It's because you're not everything you should be. And so you've got to pick the comparison right. And then that's also ennobling. It's like an instantly hopeful. There is absolutely no doubt that you can be slightly better tomorrow than you are today. And then, because of the Pareto principle, that, you know, that, that, that movement towards the good in, increases exponentially, that trajectory can just take you out of hell very, very rapidly. And so, you know, there's nothing but good about that. Yeah, so, just quick sidebar yeah. before we get to number five. So you mentioned sort of 17, we're all sort of at that same, you can't have that much differentiation That's probably between the people so around quick. you. But 30, it's a little more calcified. Yeah. Do you think there's an, a cutoff age? I don't mean exactly a number, like you're gonna say 56, but do you think that there's a point, and, and there was a question asked at Clemson where uh, somebody said to you, you know, you've really helped my 60-year-old father who had all this stuff going wrong in his life. He started listening to you and he's, he said he's, I think she said he's in the best place he's ever been yeah. or something. But do you think that there's a cutoff age where just physiologically, you can't quite do a lot of this Well, I think it gets harder, because yeah. you get more who you are as you get older. You know, so there's not, the ratio of actuality to potential starts to shift. But, but it doesn't change the, the underlying simple truth, which is there is definitely something that you can do today that will make you slightly better for the next day. Always. Always. No, let's, okay, not always. You're 85, right. you have Alzheimer's, you know, you're done. Sometimes you're done, but most of the time you're not, and most of the time there's something within your grasp that you could put right. And, see, that's the fundamental issue. It's like, life is tragic. It's full of suffering and it's full of malevolence. There's no doubt about that. And it's, it's brutal. And it's more brutal than you can even imagine in some ways, or willing to imagine. But there's something you could put right. And we don't know what would happen if you put everything you could right, if you put it right. And then we don't know what would happen if everyone did that. But you can be certain that it would be less tragic and less malevolent. And so, like, 
You don't have anything better to do than that. <laughs> right, like get get cracking. Get at it, man. Get cracking, right. man. All right. It's almost like we're all Frankenstein's monster in a weird way. If the, if the mainstream media had been dealing honestly with the issues of the day, whatever they are, identity mm -hmm. politics or postmodernism, or just the general political discussion, then I don't think people would react to you guys the way that well, they do, because they, they didn't do their job. But really quickly, because you, yep. you hit these. So your mo I think there are three moments, and, and mm -hmm. you already hit them, mm -hmm. but just for people that, that aren't following all this, you on Piers Morgan, basically bashing him endlessly with facts over feelings <laughs> about guns was one, where it was like this guy from the internet just beat this CNN per person. How did that happen? And then I think you know, the one that changed me more than anything else, everyone knows this already, was Sam Harris on Real Time yep. with, with Affleck, and they got into this stuff about, about the difference between Muslims and Islam. I didn't even know who Sam was. I see this mild-mannered neuroscientist in a nice suit calmly talking about Pew statistics. Next thing you know, he's gross and racist. But, but this is a good segue to yours, because I think yours is the third one. And the way that, it, this is just two or three weeks ago, uh, you were on with Kathy Newman on, it's Canada Channel 4, no, it was UK Channel uh, 4. UK, UK Channel 4, Channel sorry. 4, yep. And there, there's, I mean, everyone that's watching this has probably seen this already. Uh, if you haven't, you should go watch it. Yeah, and if you haven't, you should go watch it. <laughs> but, but in effect, basically she tried to make an argument that you have heard a gajillion times before, but why does your right to free speech supersede a trans person's right to feel okay with themselves or something? Even the way she phrased the question was a little confused mm -hmm. and, and conflated. But, well, I, the but, thing, but the, the reaction thing, to it, 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 yep. it your, your answer was great, but it was the reaction, the regular people watching at home that were going, this is nonsense. Mm -hmm. This is just abject nonsense. Well, the, well, the, thing, the thing that made it viral is the fact that she recognized in the moment that what she was saying was nonsense. <laughs> right, you could see. It was the moment yeah. where, where you could see the light go on briefly, and she just went, wait, what did I just say? Yeah. And there was no escape. It was, yeah. it was, pretty, it was pretty grand. Yeah. yeah, well, the funny thing about her argument is that it's pre it was predicated on the idea that somehow people have a right to be comfortable. It's like, that's just not a right you have in life. <laughs> of all the things you can say that you don't have a right to in life, being comfortable is number one. Yeah, which you made is, that point to yeah. him. You can offend me right now, well, right? So the thing is, is if you... If your right to be comfortable trumps my right to talk, then I don't get to talk, ever. Because I'm going to say things, if I'm actually talking, I'm going to say things if they're, if they're profound things, if they're contentious things or truthful things, I'm going to say things that, if they don't disturb you, are gonna disturb <laughs> you, and if they don't disturb you, there's someone that's gonna be disturbed about them. So what's the answer to that? Everyone can be comfortable in the silence. But that doesn't, also doesn't work because then we can't exchange ideas. We're not comfortable in the silence. We're isolated and dead in the silence. So it's a completely incoherent perspective. But what does that tell you about just the way mainstream media operates? Because if you even, even just in this last week when I've read some of the pieces about you that I think are so dishonestly attacking the way you do things, or even, you know, I'll see, some, uh, there was an article about you and it was like, Ben Shapiro is the cool kids philosopher or something, yeah, something like that. Times, yeah. I, yeah, and it was like, well, wait a minute, when did the cool kid be the smart Orthodox Jew? You know what I mean? Like, how did, how did it's, that happen? It's a new one to me. But, 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 <laughs> right, but, but, right, like think about that. And then you've, talk, you've right. talked about the shit that you went through when you were growing up and all that stuff, and, and you don't want to oh, yeah, play the victim. I regularly, yeah. But, I, mean, but, I, I can't imagine yeah. why. <laughs> I was in exactly the same boat, just like small, and noisy, exactly. it's a bad combination. Exactly right. Oh man, I could have taken care of both of you. I always say I was right on the middle of, of sort of like loser and cool. So like I actually did bully the kids below me, but I was bullied by the guys that were, I was right there. Maybe <laughs> that's that, how maybe God that, keeps the world in balance. There you go. <laughs> but but this idea that when they write the article, it's the cool kids philosopher, even though obviously you didn't grow up as the cool kid, or James Damore is a great one where they write articles about him and they'll say the, the tech bro. And it's like, if you, you both have met James Damore, he's the shyest, quietest, decent, you does literally, not- You almost literally have to drag sentences out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I did an hour yeah. and a half with him, we, we, yeah. <laughs> but, but he's got but, a spine of steel though. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. It's really something. Yeah. Fearless, desp yeah. despite what his disposition yeah. may actually be. But, yeah. but what do you make of that? The way that they try to frame it, so they're already trying to undercut well, you, you know again, what I mean? Before, it, before you even not say to use it, Not to use your model, but I think that they're trying to impose their own order on the chaos. It's just the wrong frame. Mm -hmm. so they, well, it, that's, it, that's what happened in the Channel 4 interview. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of, I was thinking about the model that you were describing with regards to your position on the iceberg, is that Kathy had staked out a position on the iceberg, and I had staked one out that was way lower, like mm -hmm. way lower. And 
what happened was she kept questioning me at her level of right. analysis, and that just wasn't working because that wasn't the level of analysis at which I'm playing. And I'm, and, well, and I'm also not playing, although I'm trying to play. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because right. it's better well, it's fun, if you can yeah, play exactly. a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, like wrestling. You had a lower base of gravity, mm -hmm. and and I think that that gave you an advantage. And that's well, and, partly I wasn't trying to win the interview, mm -hmm. right? You know, like I and I don't try to win interviews. I try to go to an interview and have a talk and have a discussion and well, see how it goes. And I don't have an agenda except to not make a catastrophic mistake. But, but that's, that's agenda number yeah, one. Well, yeah. Don't say anything unforgivably stupid. Yeah. But I, th I think that's I think that's the other thing that that makes all of this unique is that. If you actually meet, and you, I mean, we've all met each other in this circle now because it's really funny how life works that way. That these circles are so small that we yeah. know each other and we actually talk with each other and all this. That's what I'm um, saying. They're forcing but, us together. It's not even that we're seeking each other. But it's, right. it's also that we all have a certain, there's a certain baseline personality that we all have. And that is we enjoy the discussion. We actually enjoy the exchange of ideas. And so when you're on with Kathy Newman and she says stuff that, like, what, what, what you were getting from the right wing a lot was, how did he even stand this? How did he even stand this interview, right? How mm -hmm. can he get through half an hour of this? And you've done it, and I've, I've done it too. And the answer is because I sort of enjoy it. I mean, this is what we do for a living, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea that, that I don't enjoy having conversations, even with people who don't get it, it's not enjoyable having your views radically mischaracterized as, mm -hmm. as Kathy Newman was trying to do to you. That's irritating. Yeah. But well, it's, that it, was so over the top that it was hardly even irritating. It's mostly <laughs> you know, well, I, well, it was because right. I kept thinking, well, I don't know who you're talking to, but it isn't me. <laughs> You know, Canadians who aren't vaccinated now cannot leave the country. Yeah. Like, what the hell? Why, why is that? And I'm, look, I got vaccinated. And people took me to task for that. And I thought, all right, I'll get the damn vaccine. Here's the deal, guys. I'll get the vaccine. You fucking leave me alone. And did that work? No. So st stupid me. You know, that's how I feel about it. It's like, well, now I have to get tested for COVID when I come back into Canada. I have to get tested before I leave Canada. Now, you know, that might be the latter issue. That's an issue with the Americans. And, and so that's outside of the Canadian purview. But the restrictions to get back into Canada are even more stringent. It's like, well, why do you get the vaccine then if you're not going to leave me alone? And I don't think the evidence that unvaccinated or that vaccinated people are less contagious, let's say, I don't think it's very compelling. Yeah. So... Why are the vaccinated all of a sudden, the unvaccinated all of a sudden a danger? And I certainly don't understand the push to get children vaccinated. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's absolutely reprehensible. And I also can't figure out, Norman Deutsch wrote a piece in Tablet called Needle Points. And one of the things he pointed out was that if you take the top 25 least trusted institutions, um, that, in that group, the most distrusted institutions include Big Pharma. Mm -hmm. And for good reason, and he details out the lawsuits that Big Pharma has had to pay because of misbehavior on, on their part, broadly speaking, multiple companies over the last 20 years. And they're the biggest lawsuits in American history, which is really saying something because your court system is set up so that big lawsuits are really possible. Right. And so I see the, the leftists, all of a sudden, it's like big pharma. Yeah, trust them. It's like, what? Wh what? Really? You guys? This is, I don't understand that at all. Like, and psychologically, so what's going on here? It's like, well, I think the underlying phenomena is something like, phenomenon is something like, well, as long as it's for health and safety, it's always good. And you know, not to get conspiratorial here, but the same damn thing is going to happen with the climate change push. Absolutely. They're already, Absolutely. Re, it's already being reconfigured as, well, it's the biggest public health issue of our time. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think overreaching bureaucrats are the biggest health, uh, what would you say, the biggest challenge to our health of our time. We're expressing something that was so profoundly true that we all know that maybe we can't exactly get into the box that we can just hand to somebody and say, this is it. But that that was enough to move me. I think that's I think that's really the argument you're trying to make that you'll you'll bring to Cambridge and Oxford and to to Dawkins and everybody else. Yeah, well, and I would say in your situation, I know you're contemplating fatherhood, and it's probably the right spirit to inhabit you as a political commentator, let's say a cultural commentator. So I, that, that's a good way to reconstruct it, you know, to the degree that you can be, because you're getting old enough now to, to, that's the right role. You know, you're not yeah. sort of upward striving hero youths. It's that you're in that transition. And like benevolent father, 
That's, that's a good one, man. And there's no short, there's no limit to the number of people you can bring that to. And there's no limit to how much good that'll do in your own life and, and in relationship to your own children. So let me, I, I, I know you gotta go here. So let me, let me just ask you one other thing just to tie all of this together. Um, now, looking back at these last couple of years, the intellectual pursuits, obviously your health is better, uh, at least to some degree, you know, you're getting back out on the road, you're gonna start touring again, all of this stuff. Um, do you feel that, th that this is all really making a dent? Do you feel like, like yes, it, that it's heavy definitely. and it's real and doing something? Yes, yeah. it's more real than anything else. I don't mean what I'm doing specifically, yeah. but the sorts of things that we've been talking about. I think the will to power just folds in, in its presence. It's so much more powerful. Well, how can it not be if it's actually the truth? How can it not be more powerful than falsehood? How can what isn't there be more powerful than what is there? And why wouldn't we want to align ourselves with the truth? You know, it's really painful in the short term because there's so much mess you have to clear up. Your own and historical mess even for that matter. But it's better than living in filth. And so... Onward and upward. And yes, and I'm optimistic, man. And, and I, I've seen great people in your country on both sides of the political spectrum striving with all their might to bring things away from the insane edges. Don't lose faith. Don't lose faith in your institutions. They're great institutions. They're great institutions fundamentally. And remember, we could have, everyone could have enough to eat. Everyone could have enough energy. Everyone can have an opportunity for their children. All of that. We have all of that in front of us. We have it right now. We have it in the next 20 years. If we don't get p suspicious and paranoid and, and power mad and dis especially deceitful. If you'd like to see more honest and insightful conversations with Jordan Peterson himself, check out our Jordan Peterson playlist, which includes every interview I've ever done with him. And if you wanna watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist. Both are right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.